Thank you. Please be seated. First, I'd like to welcome uh, the alumni and friends who may be visiting us for reunion weekend. Uh, it's very good to have you back on campus, especially after a couple of years where, of course, homecoming was suspended because of COVID. And so it's, um, and I'm especially grateful for those of you who've come to lecture on a Friday night. It's a pleasure to, not, uh, to introduce tonight's lecturer, Professor Mary Townsend. Ms. Townsend, too, is an alumna of the college. And I can remember uh, well how much, as a somewhat bewildered new tutor, I admired and depended on her contributions to class conversations. It's no surprise that she's gone on to rather more notable accomplishments. She earned a master's in philosophy at the Catholic University of America and a doctorate at Tulane. And she's now an assistant professor of philosophy at St. John's University in New York. Her book, The Woman Question, in Plato's Republic is very well regarded. In the words of one reviewer, it liberates women from the shadows and corners of the dialogue and puts them at the center of Socrates' proposals regarding politics and philosophy. She writes on a wide variety of subjects, and her lecture this evening is entitled The Concept of Irony with Continual Reference to Socrates, Kierkegaard on the Infinity of Socratic Irony. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mary Townsend. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dean McFarland. I'm really glad to be here. Um, it's really great to be here on Homecoming, and I hope that what I'm about to say about Socrates and Kierkegaard uh, becomes the occasion for a lot of conversation. Um, as you're going to hear, Kierkegaard's early views on Socrates um, are actually rather scandalous. Um, he does try to solve, though, I think, a problem that you may not have noticed, but you will notice once I talk about it. Um, the strange phenomenon that readers of Plato are often attached to fundamentally different versions of the same character, uh, that is, Socrates. So if Socratic irony is infinite in the way that Kierkegaard explains it, this could be the reason for the multiplicity that we experience. In Plato's dialogue, The Mino, the character Mino has this to say about his experience talking with Socrates. Before I even met you, Socrates, I used to hear that you were always in a state of perplexity and that you bring others into the same state. And now I think you are bewitching and beguiling me, simply putting me under a spell so that I am quite perplexed. Indeed, if a joke is in order, you seem, in appearance, and every other way, to be like the broad torpedo fish, for it too makes anyone who comes close and touches it feel numb. And you now seem to have had that kind of effect on me, for both my mind and my tongue are numb, and I have no answer to give you. If you were to behave like this as a stranger in another city, you would be driven away for practicing sorcery. So Mino presents us with the constellation of metaphors. Plato's Socrates is a poisonous fish who has made his soul numb. He is like a magician who howls out enchantments, always himself in a state of confusion or aporia, and always putting others into the same state. It is this same confusion of qualities that Kierkegaard sets out to explain in his 1841 dissertation presented for the completion of the degree of Magister of Arts, the concept of irony with continual reference to Socrates. For the youthful Kierkegaard, still writing under his own name, just before setting out on his massive project of synonymous works, Socrates' irony is all-encompassing, something he calls an absolute infinite negativity, the very thing that taunts us, draws us in, and pushes, it back, pushes us back about Socrates, forcing us into continual aporia and never letting us go. Kierkegaard even compares Socrates to a mysterious witch uh, from an obscure Danish fairy tale, a witch who, for mysterious reasons, desires to eat everything in the world until, running out of anything else, she turns her desire inward and eats up her own stomach. Kierkegaard Socrates turns his absolute infinite negativity on the world and then himself is finally swept away by it as witnessed by the strange circumstances of his death. So the official defense that Kierkegaard made of his dissertation did not actually go very well. It lasted for seven and a half hours. It was in Latin. Um, and a witness described it as a game of toss in the blanket, where, one presumes, the examiners were the ones in the blanket. 
Uh, one can see this pattern in the text of the dissertation as well. The reader is tossed from metaphor to metaphor about Socratic irony. Socrates tunnels under existence. Socrates' magnifying glass is unerring. Compared to the rest of us, he is like a flying fish in relation to ordinary fish and birds. But one also quickly notices the oddity of an actual clunky paragraph here and there, a strained transition, a repetition that doesn't form the kind of satisfying whole that we're used to from Kierkegaard's other very beautiful writings. In fact, Kierkegaard twists and turns into the strain of writing in what is obviously not his medium, the scholarly style. And he is still much more wedded to Hegelian thought than he would later become. And he records in his journals uh, the relief of the sense that dissertation complete, he would then henceforth be at leisure to write as he pleased. But while Kierkegaard's many pseudonyms later present their versions of Socrates and his relationship to knowledge, seen in the portraits of Johannes de Silencio's Fear and Trembling and Johannes Climacus's Philosophical Fragments. In his dissertation, Kierkegaard presents as Socrates with a peculiar kind of volatility that can be traced to the strange yet familiar way his words and deeds seem to flicker with a charged but still mysterious meaning in a way that other Platonic characters, from Thrasymachus to Alcibiades, will relate to and find uh, very familiar. As Kierkegaard puts it, irony presupposes an infinite sympathy from the listener, but contains fleeting but indescribable instants of understanding that are immediately superseded by the anxiety of misunderstanding. It's not, as Kierkegaard will argue, that Socrates is speaking in some kind of semaphore or code. Uh, for Kierkegaard, that would be finite irony, as I will explain. But rather, Socrates speaks in a certain kind of relation to language that contains an endless aporetic suspension, and one that is preeminently capable of tempting the reader into more direct and passionate philosophical disclosure themselves. As I'll argue, this kind of infinite Socratic stance can help explain our infinitely different set of responses to Plato's Socrates. And it might also help us with the further problem that Kierkegaard points out that there can be no real community among ironists because of the way they stand outside of ordinary speech. And nor can there be real fellow feeling amongst the responses to an ironist of the first order. If this is so, we should start to consider the better sort of friendship that becomes possible as common lovers of the author of our favorite ironist, that is, the friendship we have with Plato, and together as readers of him. Part one, a common trouble. I'll start with an observation about our communal platonic reading lives. Have you ever noticed just how many Socrateses there are? There are, first of all, the Socrateses of the Socratic circle, where numerous Greek people who had either met or heard tell of the living Socrates decided to write up their own version. Plato's Socrates and Xenophon's Socrates, of course, but also the versions of Aeschines, Antisthenes, possibly even Simeus and Sieves, who are otherwise characters in Plato's Phaedo. But even these are not enough Socrateses for us. For beyond the ones merely written down, there's, there seem to be even more that exist in the soul. For instance, as soon as you start reading Plato and meet with Plato's interesting version, a very strange thing happens. You'll notice it when after you read, you sit down to talk about Socrates with other people, and you find you've got the opposite impression of him from the person with whom you're speaking. So much so that it can even be as if you've read two different books. First of all, while many people instantly love Socrates, many people just as quickly realize they hate his guts. In the classroom, I've often noticed that people who flat out hate Socrates will often find philosophy not particularly appealing either. Um, fortunately, however, it's possible for hatred of Socrates to turn to love, and there are many such cases. It's worth, it's worth observing, though, the next time you have a chance to see how this love and hate play out in response to Socrates' death sentence in the Apology. While some enjoy the ironic thought that in many ways, Socrates might be guilty of corrupting the youth, it's also possible for the human beings simply to be glad he was condemned to death 
because he was that annoying. If you've ever heard people actually say this, it's really, really intense. Um, but for the many people whose response skews towards love, Socrates is a hero who inspires a range of interesting varieties of admiration and emulation. As Epictetus, the Stoic, puts it, death is not terrible, for otherwise it would have seemed so to Socrates. And he says, and though you're not yet a Socrates, you ought to live as one desirous of becoming a Socrates. This is something of a dangerous sentiment, as Kierkegaard will explain in a moment. And yet, Epictetus is hardly alone in having this sort of emulation for him. Another version of this heroism is to see Socrates as a model teacher, gentle, kind. Despite, of course, his claim to have never taught anyone anything in the Apology, and the reasonable complaint that all of Xenophon's protestations cannot do away with, that no insignificant number of people who kept company with him became quite wicked indeed. And then, many of those who love Socrates love him for something quite distinct from gentleness. To this group, it's his scathing harshness that attracts, his shameless ability to browbeat his interlocutor, to make Thrasymachus blush. To square this harshness with this benevolence is difficult. It's not quite enough to say he reserves harshness for some occasions and not others. Again, the tendency is to want to make one of these qualities an absolute and primary aspect of his character. I'll note in passing that there's one version of Socrates that we can probably set aside, namely the boring one, the nice guy, who asks questions that would never seriously trouble us, who would always be on our side. Such a version of Socrates inspires neither love nor hate. But wherever Socrates does inspire emotion, and therefore opposing views, people often find themselves out of charity with each other. And there are as sharp or sharper disagreements about his opinions about life and the universe than simply his soul. For instance, for some, Socrates is a sort of heaven-sent precursor of Christian thought. For others, Socrates is the skeptic of heaven and earth par excellence. For some, the characteristically Greek caution to Socrates' piety is exemplary. For others, he is the most committed and wittiest atheist to have walked the earth. These oppositions play out not only in individual human reactions, of course, but also in various shifting tides of scholarship over the centuries, and actually in Plato's academy as well. Plato left the academy to a mathematician, his sister's son, Specifus. But before more than 100 years had passed, the academy had taken a skeptical turn, with Arcesilaus at the head, who argued for life without any beliefs at all. Arcesilaus, in turn, makes quite a contrast to Plotinus's insistence on the good, intellect, and soul as the primary three existing things. And finally, there's just endless oppositions that show up in people's thinking about Socrates. Claims about how he was really wealthy or actually really poor. Um, some people want to say he's actually really aristocratic, and other people say that he's, oh, he's very egalitarian. Um, people often divide on whether he's really emotional or he's just strictly unemotional in his soul. And, um, and again, some people experience him as kind, and other people as very cruel. So what are we going to do about all these Socrateses? We do not do this sort of multiplication, for instance, with other characters. Like, think about George Eliot's Dorothea. It's very charming, but we don't do this. Or even somebody more complicated, like um, Cervantes' Don Quixote. And then also, once the multiplication happens, people also very quickly develop a strong attachment to the reality of their version of Socrates. And they don't want to admit at all that there's anything idiosyncratic to their own particular insight. I'm guilty of this, too. The lover of the skeptical Socrates thinks nothing is more foolish than seeking to lay bare the vague metaphysical schemes behind Socrates' wilder visions. The lover of the pious Socrates is continually taken aback by the willful resentiment by which the skeptic seems to ignore all indications to the contrary. It's almost a pleasure, if an uncanny one, to witness the immediate passion and the drawing power of Plato's Socrates um, his literary creation, the way that this has an effect on people. In fact, this effect of Plato's Socrates is one of the most impressive ways 
that Plato is continually drawing his reader into relationship to his text, and so into philosophy. And so the multiplicity of so Socrates' continues as each reader picks up Plato anew. One last observation. It is a fact that the love of Socrates is not quite the same thing as the love of Plato. There's actually a name for the former, sorry, the latter, the love of Plato in Greek, Philoplatonus, the friends of Plato. But despite there being a word for it, the love of Plato seems to be a much rarer thing than the lover of Socrates. And why would this be so? <laughs> Even if Socrates' obsession most often begins through reading Plato, Plato himself is such a remarkable writer that we seem to forget his presence, even as we develop a passion for his main character, and such as Plato's humility. When in love with Socrates, a human or more than human form fills one's frame of attention. He's almost like a diamond on the shoulder. But with Plato, whose own voice we hear so little of, the sensation of philos or friendly love is more like being in the presence of a garden, if you will, one with its own fountain, perhaps, a place where for a time it's possible to rest and a place that when absent from, one longs to dream of again. Part two, Kierkegaard's relief in Plato. Kierkegaard himself, in his dissertation, places himself firmly on the side of the lovers of Plato. Dear critic, he writes, allow me just one sentence, one guileless parenthesis, in order to vent my gratitude, my gratitude for the relief I found in reading Plato. This quality of relief specifically is striking. Um, in Plato, it seems something is recovered or made whole for the youthful Kierkegaard that could not be found in the high-wire act of Hegel's system. As Hegel describes his philosophy in Phenomenology of, Phenomenology of Spirit, it is a kind of progress to knowing, as though, through the Stations of the Cross, a philosophy in search of positive knowledge by means of the inexorable dialectic of the idea which will often be quite excruciating. The youthful Kierkegaard finds it important that Hegel's philosophy is on the way towards the, what he calls the concrete and the positive, as it were, by means of the mediating force of the negative, but always with a momentum that carries us past pure negativity and negation. I'll give you an example. At one point, in the Encyclopedia Logic, Hegel even insists that the very stars in the sky should be held to be inferior to the lowest organic slime. So much so must organic life sublate everything else in due course. But who could despise the stars? And what kind of philosophy must it be to be willing to do that? Well might one find relief in Plato. And Kierkegaard even describes his love as an infatuation, an infatuation with enthusiasm. Where is balm to be found, he writes, if not in the infinite tranquility with which, in the quiet of the night, the idea soundlessly, solemnly, gently, and yet so powerfully unfurls in the rhythm of the dialogue, as if there were nothing else in the world, where every step is deliberated and repeated slowly, solemnly, because the ideas themselves seem to know that there is time and an arena for all of them. Kierkegaard's youthful thoughts about Socrates, in contrast to Plato, are rather different. And for Kierkegaard, and, and from here on out, um, please hear the young Kierkegaard, the 28-year-old, when I simply say Kierkegaard, rather than any other later version he puts forward for himself. Um, for Kierkegaard, what Socrates says in his defense speech in the Apology, that he knows that he knows nothing, is foundational to his life, his character, and his irony. As even the lovers of Socrates know, the knowledge that one knows nothing is a kind of paradox. If you know that you know nothing, you know nothing except for this one thing that you do not know anything else, that you know nothing. Um, in this way, you both know and you do not know. And what you do not know is infinite in scope compared to the tiny point on which you stake your claim of awareness of your radical ignorance. For Kierkegaard, taking this paradoxical sort of knowledge seriously forces us to reassess the exact kind of person that Socrates has to be in order that he really, really is able to fully hold on to this strange human posture. 
Like Socrates the hero or Socrates the pious, Kierkegaard's Socrates does possess a kind of earnestness, but not because he's worked out a morality or a theology, or even because he died for something. Rather, Kierkegaard's Socrates is earnest in his endless search, precisely because at the end of his life, he staked himself on ignorance, and therefore uncomfortably, his earnestness is a sort of earnestness about nothing at all. Because if you know nothing, what's solid enough for you to be earnest about? In other words, Socrates is ironic and remains at ironic distance from all definitive knowledge. His character, therefore, is infinitely elastic, eternally suspended and in suspense, never definitive, or as Kierkegaard puts it in Hegelian terms, it's never positive. Even Socrates' knowledge of love or erotics is a knowledge of something negative or not the egg. That is, eros in the sense of absence, rather than the fullness of positive love. This entails that Socrates' remarkable virtues are not pedestrian like ours, but spring from a kind of otherworldly health. Kierkegaard notes that while in Xenophon, Socrates is simply impressively temperate or abstemious towards food, money, and drink. But in Plato, Socrates' ability to drink all underneath tables comes not from temperance, but from some divine quality of health in him. This superabundance of health in Socrates, however, is like the rosy complexion of someone, Kierkegaard says, in the last stages of tuberculosis, <laughs> where the body, in a last mighty effort, burns itself up and yet glows in the cheeks. Again, the story of the witch is parallel to this. Even skepticism always posits something, whereas irony, like that old witch, continually makes the very tantalizing attempt to eat up everything first of all, and thereupon, to eat up itself. For Kierkegaard, Socrates is more than simply skeptical. He does not simply negate one set of positive arguments in the service of some concrete suspicion. Instead, he must negate everything, all sides of the argument, up to and including himself, like the witch who finally turns her appetite on her own internal organs. In this way, Socrates must always remain on the outskirts of knowledge, or what Kierkegaard calls the idea, the concept. On these grounds, Socrates can be neither believer nor atheist, neither pious nor impious, but rather agnostic, or even actually something even more radical than that. It's this radical quality to Socrates that Kierkegaard insists on in his dissertation, and it's the quality that I continually find in arresting about his approach. Um, and I think we can at least say of it that it is not boring. It is also, however, terrifying. As Kierkegaard will argue, death and what happens after death is simply something we ought to take more seriously, more earnestly than Socrates can in his paradoxical ignorance. Part two, a platonic interlude. So how can we connect this initial portrait of infinite Socratic irony with the more immediate view we get of Socrates and Plato? Early on in Plato's Republic, Socrates attempts to defend himself against the violent way that Thrasymachus has burst in upon his peaceful conversation with Polemarchus. Socrates says, don't be angry with us, Thrasymachus. Don't think that when we're searching for justice, a thing far more precious than gold, we'd be so silly as to defer to each other and not look for it as hard as we can. We're looking, my friend, but I guess we're just not up to it. So we really deserve pity rather than anger from clever fellows like you. Thrasymachus responds to this statement in a way that many readers find to be an immediate mirror to their feeling, the feeling of mouth-dropping astonishment that Socrates after the masterful way he's maneuvered his previous interlocutors, has the temerity to, to continue to claim to be ignorant. Thrasymachus therefore laughs from the inside out, on a concasse, a sort of an onomatopoeia for a choking kind of laugh, and sardonically with a sort of bitterness as when Sardonion, one has bitten into a certain kind of Sardinian plant. Oh, exquisite, oh, Heracles, Thrasymachus manages to say once he's finished choking. The famous habitual Socratic irony, I knew it, and I foretold it to these present, that you would not be willing to answer, but you would dissemble 
and make up anything rather than answer if someone asked you something. Thrasymachus is appealing to the crowd to recognize something that he at least believes he already knows. There's a habit of Socrates, something about him that should be visible to us, a habit of Irenaea. Socrates ironizes rather than answering, and sometimes even seems to poeticize, as he says, poesois, and so quite possibly even to be making things up. And as Alcibiades puts it in the symposium, Socrates spends his whole life ironizing, even playing pides on, with others, that is, ironizing his fellow man, while regarding wealth, possessions, and all other people, he says, as nothing. These vivid descriptions in Plato, one from a hater who becomes a friend, and one from a disappointed lover who at times seems almost like an enemy, draw us once again to that opposition of feelings that Socrates' character seems to create for his fellow man. Neither Platonic speaker, of course, is necessarily speaking the whole truth, as neither hate nor eros could really do. But both speakers agree that Socrates' ironic existence is a kind of a riddle, one that demands to be solved, and that there is something all-encompassing about the way that Socrates relates to irony. Aristotle, despite speaking from more historical and emotional distance, echoes the sense of totalitization when he describes Socrates' ironia in the Nicomachean Ethics as a kind of vice. That is most certainly not an excellence, but however a real habit, something that has arisen out of a life's worth of deliberate choices not to tell the truth about himself to other people. The language that Kierkegaard uses to describe this all-encompassing aspect of Socrates' irony expands upon the Greek sense of habit by using the more Hegelian language of totality, infinity, not unlike the sort of actual infinity that Aristotle would find so shocking. Socratic irony, definitionally, is absolute, infinite negativity. In this way, it is not only the vocation of a human life, but a sort of endless restlessness, and always something more. And to my ear, the phrase expresses very well the sort of endless energy that Plato's Socrates seems to possess. Now, Kierkegaard explains Socratic irony in three ways. First, as a relation to language, and how Socrates intends to be understood by his listeners. Secondly, as the source and quality of his actions. And finally, as sort of a metaphysical position of his soul, as seen preeminently in his relationship to death. First, I'll speak to the question of language, and then use these distinctions to explain the deeds, the metaphysics, and the death. Part three, infinite irony in language. When we speak, Kierkegaard writes, there is a relation between our thought and our word, between our meaning and what precisely we say. The thought and the meaning are the essence, he says, and the words we use are the phenomena. For truth to occur, there must be an identity between meaning and word, but also more than just simple identity alone. Our character has to be involved as well. When we speak the truth, we must stake ourselves on our word and our thought and invest ourselves in some crucial way. Because when I tell you the truth, I am bound or fixed in some important way by what has been said. As Kierkegaard notes, here the old verse is appropriate. Semel emissum volat irrecabile verum. The word once let slip flies beyond recall. To say something true is itself a kind of an action where we leave possibility behind and concretely stand up for our meaning, and manfully take whatever response from other people they would like to give in return. The terror of telling the truth, therefore, is real. For what if we're wrong? And our wrongness will remain irrevocably on record. Or what if our words give pain forever? Or what if we happen to be talking to a sophist who will find some way to ridicule not simply what we said, but the self that took a stand as well? There is an existential gamble, it seems, in Kierkegaard's description to all of our truth-telling. In irony, therefore, there lies a very deep temptation. For what if we wish to remain free of the burden of ourself? What if we could sidestep the concrete act of truth, not by lying, but by remaining suspended above the meaning somehow? There are several ways of doing this. Uh, as Kierkegaard puts it, some are finite, and some, of course, are infinite. 
In the finite sense, we use irony as a tool, as something to master, a literary device. Kierkegaard's examples are how we often express enthusiasm about something we are simply not enthusiastic about, as a student might say, yay, paper writing. Or, in the opposite case, we show mock repugnance at something we love in order to convey our love, as when a writer explains at great length just how much they hate writing. Kierkegaard notes that this sort of irony is very good at deflating what is overinflated in us, as in his example, someone too in love with his especially beautiful sideburns, or someone too fixated on one idea. The diplomat, he says, can speak from a profound, contemptuous, yet still finite irony, saying to himself, the world wants to be deceived, therefore let it be deceived. Or, he says, someone might speak with irony to the simplest persons, not to mock them, but to mock the wise. But, and this is the crucial distinction, our meaning in these instances is not obscure. We still manage to convey our meaning pretty directly. Uh, for instance, um, mocking the so-called wise, as when Kierkegaard makes fun of it, Hegel, it's clear we simply mean the opposite of what we say. Explaining why Hegel can't be bothered to examine the dramatic detail in Platonic dialogue, Kierkegaard writes, when the phenomena are paraded, Hegel is in too much of a hurry and too aware of his role as commander-in-chief of world history to take time for much more than a royal glimpse of such trivial details. Um, in this case, our meaning is clear. Hegel's royal vision clearly leaves much to be desired. This form of irony, however, cancels itself out. Because it is still limited to a finite meaning, we are saying Hegel is not Napoleon. And so the human character who has conveyed the opposite of his word remains fairly present to us. We know that Kierkegaard finds Hegel at times to be annoying. And the human character has still gambled, for the most part, himself on something concrete. The readers of Kierkegaard's dissertation did not find his Hegel jokes funny. Um, they thought they were vulgar, actually, <laughs> and affected. Um, and for a moment, um, there was even a chance that his dissertation might not have been approved. They hated the title. They want it to be changed. But the true ironist, the infinite ironist, looks for greater freedom from his meaning and from truth telling itself than this. Infinite irony is looking for infinite suspension, infinite freedom from the finite self. Kierkegaard insists that Socrates is an infinite ironist in thought, word, and deed. Socrates stakes his words in a radically different way from the rest of us. He rests suspended behind them not unlike the god on the crane in the tragic stage. Socrates winks, but never quite conveys exactly what he's winking about. His words are neither simple statements of truth, nor are they meant to say the opposite. But rather, at times, they even seem to flicker with irony, leaving the reader in turn, in eternal suspense. Take the example of Socrates' words to Thermogus before. We're looking for truth, my friend, but I guess we're just not up to it. So we really deserve pity rather than anger from clever fellows like you. These words are not untrue. It's true that it's possible that Polemarchus and Socrates were wrong to conclude that it's never just to harm anyone. And it's possible that Thrasymachus is very clever and ought to pity them. On the other hand, even the most casual reader suspects that Socrates might not think that so Thrasymachus is very clever or that Socrates would so quickly abandon what he persuaded Polemarchus about and what Polemarchus agreed to. Socrates' words here seem to exist in some way both half in and half out of the truth, half present where meaning and word connect. For another example, consider Socrates' way of describing the distinction between true opinion and knowledge in the Mino. I too speak as one who does not have knowledge and is guessing. However, I certainly do not think I am guessing when I say that right opinion is a different thing from knowledge. If I claim to know anything else, and I would make that claim about few things, I would put this down as one of the things I know. What? <laughs> Socrates' words keep us guessing. His irony has, as Kierkegaard puts it, an ubique et nusquam quality, and everywhere and nowhere to it. Now by this, Kierkegaard does not mean that Socrates' words are empty. Rather, they are always pregnant with meaning, but they never give birth, 
quite. Socrates' words therefore leave us suspended in a kind of captivating possibility. In some sense, Socrates is giving us part of what might be meant as the real truth of something, while also simultaneously pointing to everything he leaves unspoken, everything that's incomplete about what he says, and all the things that might additionally be true despite it, some third thing. Another example, in the Republic, Socrates claims he's ignorant of what justice is. But there is such a strong temptation to believe that he's not exactly ignorant, since after all, it turns out, when prompted, he has quite a lot to say. And yet, as he continually reminds us, the evening's conversation is but one version of the truth. There is a longer and harder road to travel to the real thing. And even the good, the beautiful principle beyond even being itself, is but an image of the real thing itself. Socrates remarks that he's even trembling in his ignorance about these things, lest he mislead us. And yet, strictly speaking, if his knowledge of ignorance is real and present at that moment, he can have no idea whether he's misleading us or not. In Plato's dialogues, Socrates often speaks of seeing something in a dream, or of an argument as Dionysian music drumming into his head, or as a half-remembered report from mysterious men and women, as in the Mino. Truth, Kierkegaard says, or at any rate the fullness of truth, always remains at a distance. OK, but this does not mean Socrates is simply lying. Kierkegaard points out that dissimulation in this way is not the same thing as irony. Dissimulation has a finite and specific purpose, where I mismatch word and meaning in a specific way in order to achieve some tangible goal. No, I didn't steal the watch when I did, or I'll see you next week when I will not, but I don't want you to know that yet. Uh, concrete goal. Uh, neither is irony some kind of hypocrisy. Socrates is not a wicked person pretending to be a good one. That's simply another specific and delimited kind of concrete human goal. Real infinite irony, by contrast, Kierkegaard writes, has no purpose. Or rather, he says, its, its purpose is imminent in itself and is a kind of metaphysical purpose, the glee of mismatching word and meaning for its own sake, the fun of being understood only to yourself. Irony is the delight of being mysterious, of pronouncing a double or even triple entendre, not in order to communicate some fact in a slightly more complicated way, but to withhold oneself suspended above the finitude of the definitive statement, simply, simply, for sheer delight. And the next part, infinite irony indeed. If Socrates' linguistic relationship to irony is freedom and glee, what will be the irony of his deeds? Kierkegaard makes the story Socrates tells of his life in the Apology central to his understanding. He's taken up a divine mission, inaugurated by the Delphic Oracle, whose claim that he's the wisest of men Socrates feels compels to test. This mission will be as all-encompassing as his relationship to language. It will saturate all of his works. Therefore, in order to show people their ignorance, he negates all the opinions of all in order to show their untruth and the limitations of every human opinion. Like Samson, Socrates grafts the pillars that support knowledge and tumbles everything down into the nothingness of ignorance. Such deeds as we know make Socrates a rather dangerous man. As everyone knows, to have Socrates over to your house, as Cephalus does in the Republic, or to face off with him as Gorgias briefly manages, or even just to have a quick chat, as in the case of Euthyphro, is to court disaster. Of course, the deeds of Kierkegaard's Socrates can't simply be refutational. He also has to beguile the listener with a myth, a myth, a dream, or a prayer. These actions, though, can often be no less unsettling. As Glaucon puts it when he responds to Socrates' metaphor of the cave, Strange image, and your prisoner's strange. And in the Alcibiades too, Kierkegaard notes, Socrates takes care to pray for a good that he does not yet know, asking the god to correct any ignorance or mistake still present in the prayer. In this way, Socrates is avoiding praying for something. Such myths and prayers can certainly inspire us to positivity or concrete knowledge, as I'll discuss in a moment. But while Socrates is certainly a midwife, who can cut the umbilical cord of someone else's thought. 
Kierkegaard points out that this is not the same as being a true mentor to someone. Again, Socrates claims to have never actually taught anyone anything. And in his relations with all who come to converse with him, Kierkegaard remarks that he did not assume responsibility for the later life of his students and did not consider that their tutelage laid on his shoulders an enormous ethical burden that required a fatherly concern to never lose sight of them. Alcibiades is Kierkegaard's prime example, as possessing the anguish that is seen in this, as seen in the symposium comes not just from unrequited love, but unrequited studentship. Then there is Socrates' daimon, or divine sign, that influences his deeds. But even this daimon is negative, rather than positive. It warns, but it does not advise. Finally, Socrates' philosophical notions seem also to Kierkegaard to share this characteristic negation. As he puts it, Socrates brings us to the doorstep, or the boundary of the idea, but does not stake himself concretely on one thing being finally concretely true. This is a fair point in this sense, that Socrates is not Aristotle. He's certainly not Hegel. Um, Socrates' deeds and words do not commit him to a final philosophical stance or system, um, analogous the way to the way that he does not commit himself in writing. In this way, Kierkegaard says, Socrates has infinitely circumnavigated existence. Part four, the melancholy of infinite irony. To live, like, to live like this, to have an entire life be like this, is not comfortable. To be the possessor of such refutations, such partial prayers and dreams, requires a kind of loneliness of spirit. And Kierkegaard's Socrates buys his ironic freedom at a high cost. Consider that while Socrates' ignorance is a kind of self-knowledge, it's only a very specific kind. This can be seen in Socrates' morbidly terrifying claim in the Phaedrus, that he does not know whether he is a gentle animal or a wild and terrible monster. Again, he's like the witch eating up everything, and even herself. Socratic irony carries everything away, until it finally carries Socrates away too. To have refuted without upbuilding something, without upbuilding something lasting in someone, to die without having raised up a philosophical peer, to be at the end of your life without having gained the knowledge you sought since your youth, and not to even know yourself. All of this is a difficult life. But for Kierkegaard, this sort of loneliness is seen most of all in Socrates' attitude towards his own death and death itself. Consider again the radical nature of Kierkegaard Socrates' agnosticism, or rather, his eternal ironic suspension towards the truth of the gods, whether they exist or not, or in what way. This ironic suspension shows itself in the question of whether or not there will be something for Socrates after death. In the Apology, Socrates offers several arguments why death cannot be regarded as something terrible. First of all, we simply do not know anything about it, and it's reprehensible to have a fear about anything we do not know the nature of. Furthermore, if death is like unconsciousness, then it will resemble a dreamless sleep, which no one would dispute is more pleasant than the majority of all other days and nights. And finally, if death is a movement to another place, Socrates will continue to interrogate the dead to see whom among them is wise and who is not. Who could keep from smiling, Kierkegaard remarks, when we contemplate Socrates continuing his refutational activities, even in hell. <laughs> Socrates speaks definitively upon his own attitude when he pronounces, I do not care anything at all about death, Apology 32D. For Kierkegaard, this relation to death is profoundly disturbing. He says, Socrates is not setting the pathos of enthusiasm against the fear of death but instead finds it a curious hypothesis to surmise total extinction. Recall that for Epictetus, this stance towards death was admirable, but for Kierkegaard, it's even a crime, which he says, and if we were to describe the crime, in one word, we could call it a prognosune, indolence, or indifferentism. Kierkegaard notes that in his very early youth, this passage in the Apology left him feeling disappointed, even deceived or depressed, 
that Socrates, the hero, would be so unmoved by something so important, even made his character seem prosaic. But by the time of his dissertation, Kierkegaard came to see this not as dullness, but as an extraordinarily terrifying and singular human stance. And now I'll read from the concept of irony. All these passages manifest Socrates' complete incertitude. But, please note, not as if this incertitude had disquieted him. No, on the contrary, this game with life, this giddiness, with death showing itself at one time infinitely significant, and another time is nothing, is what appeals to him. On the front of the stage, then, is Socrates, not as someone who rashly brushes away the thought of death and clings anxiously to life, not as someone who eagerly goes towards death and magnanimously sacrifices his life. No, as someone who takes delight in the alteration of light and shadow, found in a syllogistic out-out, either or, when it almost simultaneously manifests broad daylight and pitch darkness, manifests the infinitely real and the infinitely nothing. As someone who, on behalf of his audience, also takes delight in the fact that these two points are like pleasure and pain, joined together at the top, and yet, on that account, does not crave certainty with the soul's fervent longing, but with a kind of inquisitiveness, longs for the solution of this riddle. So why, might we ask, why is that position so bad? What is the cost of such a stance? In Fear and Trembling, Johannes de Silencio writes, if a human being did not have an eternal consciousness, if underlying everything, there are only a wild fermenting power that writhing in dark passions produced everything. If a vast, never appeased emptiness hid beneath everything, what would life be, then, but despair? If, that's precisely the question, and Kierkegaard thinks that it's our philosophical duty to think something about death, to think something about life, something specific, rather than suspend ourselves eternally next to the possibility. Death, ought to mean something to us. We ought to care something about it. And our reckoning with death ought to be a moment for a serious decision about what our mortality says about the cosmos we inhabit and how we ought to live our lives. Unlike so Socrates' inquisitiveness that longs for the solution to existence as though it were only a riddle, we ought to crave certainty with fervent longing, not so that we can ourselves become a Hegel and produce a definitive philosophical system but so that we can stake ourselves on some ironic truth-telling statement, some unironic truth-telling statement, however finite and potentially false, and thus leave the amorphous and unreal freedom of irony behind. But this Kierkegaard Socrates did not do. And Kierkegaard reminds us again that this ought to cause us to be fundamentally wary of his character. Because Socrates circumnavigated existence, Without setting himself down within it, he cannot even be a tragic hero for us. For the tragic hero, Kierkegaard says, death is truly the final battle and the final suffering. Life mattered to the hero, and so it could also matter when he gave it up. But because death has no reality for Socrates, even his death is ironic. For how could the state punish someone by delivering to them the very thing, death, which matters to them? Not at all. And the final part, some things that result from infinite irony. As I've been speaking to you and relaying Kierkegaard's youthful vision of Socrates as this kind of ironist, um, at times I think I could probably hear your negation of my negations. That is, all the ways in which Kierkegaard's interpretation of Socrates is flat out contradicted by something in the Platonic Dialogues, and all the ways in which Kierkegaard simply seems wrong about Socrates. And I agree, somewhat. The youthful Kierkegaard is not a perfect or even correct interpreter of the Dialogues. And it's very likely um, that this interpretation of him will raise our anger if we're already committed to Socrates the hero, Socrates the telegraphic atheist, Socrates the successful metaphysician. And it's also, of course, open to the charge that this is just another image of Socrates rather than some real conceptual version. And it, it must be said, and said again, 
Socratic knowledge of ignorance has an endless and extraordinary powerful ability to deflate all of our hubris with respect to knowledge, and we can never, ever let that aspect of it go. But I do think Kierkegaard is onto something when he forces us to really face the radical nature of Socratic doubt, which these other images of Socrates can hide from us. Because I think Socratic doubt, and even irony itself, are really more disturbing than we'd often like to admit. In this last part, I'm going to speak to a couple of things I think we often get wrong about Plato's Socrates that Kierkegaard's image can serve as good medicine for. First, on the order of interpretation of Plato, then in terms of ethical stance of Socrates, his metaphysical longings, our attempt to befriend him, and finally, the temptation to emulate him. For instance, first of all, there's often a strong temptation to make some kind of concrete truth out of Plato's Socrates' words, to find the truth behind them, to make actual, as Kierkegaard might put it, what remains in the text as possibility or dream. This temptation is very strong, and I think it's part of the way that Socratic irony works to draw us out of ourselves into our own philosophizing. That Socrates leaves unspoken the longer road is part of the midwifery of his irony. We're meant to respond to the potency of the text, and so become awake and not sleeping, to philosophize on our own, to attempt to solve better what piety, beauty, and love are, or what might be the nature of the soul. But we are the ones giving birth, and as Socrates himself so often reminds us, it'd be better to take him at his word on this than to attempt to put words in his mouth. Because if Socrates did have some positive knowledge behind his ironic distance, then he'd be shamelessly withholding it from us. In fact, he'd be criminally ungenerous in his remarks, even actually lying to us when he tells us he does not know. Likewise, if Socrates were speaking to us as a mastermind of finite irony through some kind of code where we could discreetly read the text as the opposite of what he says every time and thus obtain the real concrete truth, what would be the point of that? Such an elaborate subterfuge seems hardly worth the effort and it would also make a mockery of the real difficulties with the nature of truth, language, and knowledge that actually infinite irony suggests. Socrates the liar and Socrates the Jesuit in disguise are far less interesting sorts of character, sort of trivially complex, uh, not really worth the time of an effort of a poet like Plato. There are plenty of ways to soften unconventional opinions, political and non-political alike, that don't make use of irony's powerful volatility. Infinite irony demands that we ourselves make decisions about what Socrates' words mean, rather than simply pretending to decipher them. And as Kierkegaard puts it, to listen for what becomes present in the silence of the presence of Socrates. Secondly, while infinite irony does not mean that Socrates is simply lying to us, um, he doesn't also become moral or a moral exemplar in some way. I think this is a hard thought to have because in general, we're not so full of moral exemplars that we can afford to lose even one, let alone Socrates. But not to know what the good, the just, and the beautiful are is a problem. And again, it's the sadness of Socrates' life that he knows them not, and he continually says that he hopes for us that we will know them better. Uh, this is not to say that the solution to this problem is to take up a single ethical system as definitively and objectively true. Think how much Kierkegaard would tease us if we made that kind of attempt. Um, rather, as the existentialist Simone de Beauvoir points out, who was very influenced on this point by Kierkegaard, we have to recognize that in every action, we are staking ourselves in all our finitude, our imperfection, and our freedom on something that to the best of our knowledge we believe to be true. Unlike the ironist, we take a risk to directly speak to and act on what we think to be the truth. And in this way, we claim our freedom and actually our language not through endless suspension from commitment, but through admitting that something specific and concrete matters to us, however much we may be wrong. Moral exemplars risks this, and I do think that Plato's Socrates, really Plato's Socrates, does resemble this at times. But Plato's Socrates, in order to give us forever a vision of what thoroughgoing knowledge of ignorance looks like, all the way down, could not commit to concrete goods in the way that we have to. We have to care more about death. We have to think something about it. 
The alternative, as Kierkegaard puts it in Sickness Unto Death, is that it's a danger to the selfhood of the soul to lose itself in infinite possibility, ethical or otherwise. The momentum of each new possibility following another in rapid succession, it seems then that everything is possible to us, at which point the individual themselves becomes a kind of mirage. And then there's a more troubling conclusion than the ones I've just detailed. A Socrates who is radically ironic, who does not teach and who does not know, cannot be your friend. He's not a pal. Kierkegaard says, we have to join, we cannot join, the scholarly professional mourners and the crowd of shallow but lachrymose humanitarians whose sighing and, and tears have tears because such a good man, such an honest human being, a paragon, a cosmopolitan, rolled into one, became the victim of the meanest envy. Friendship rests on shared virtue and to a certain extent a shared vision of what's important. Socrates' life propels us into seeking to philosophize with friends, but he manages to propel us in this way precisely because he's not a friend, rather because he preserves the relentless, endless energy of negation or midwifery. In the same sense that midwives are not your friends exactly, the sort of giving birth together in the beautiful that Socrates describes in the symposium rests on a greater love and intimacy than Socrates seems to have allowed himself with any other person, with the possible exception of Phaedrus. But worse than the notion that Socrates can't be your friend is that neither can anyone committed infinitely to irony be in a community or be in friendship with anyone else. As Kierkegaard puts it, there is just as little social unity in a coterie of ironists as there is real honesty in a band of thieves. The ironist delights in being misunderstood and so never allows himself the bond of understanding with any group of human beings either. Therefore, any group that claims to be a group of irony is either not a real group with real cohesion or not a group of ironists at all, but rather a group united by some other thing, often by ambition or vanity or a combination of the two. And then finally, the most troubling conclusion of all, if all of this is true, so little can we take Socrates as the ideal human, as a model for ethical or philosophical life, we cannot and should not imitate Socrates at all. This is the opposite version of so many of our images of Socrates, whether skeptical or dogmatic, pious or impious. Most of these are united still in the sense that these, this particular version of Socrates can offer us the right way to live. But again, how can we literally imitate, really model ourselves after, someone who is unsure whether he is a gentle animal or a wild and terrible monster. Surely we ought to make up our minds about this one. And to do this, we will have to act differently, be in the world differently than Socrates. And then one oddity of Socrates' words is that they often seem to telegraph beyond the page, to speak not just to this interlocutor of the moment, but to the reader and to posterity itself. In fact, they're often simply more convincing to the reader, to us, than they were to the people in the scene. I think we learn more about virtue than Mino does. We respond differently to, from his peers to Socrates' legal defense. We are not incapacitated, incapacitated by tears as his companions are in the Phaedo, not quite the same way. And after all, what would it really mean if we set out to imitate this aspect of Socrates? Should we always be speaking to someone other than the person in front of us? I don't think so. As in the other cases, our actions require more commitment to what is in front of our nose. And it is simply often rude to offer someone irony when what they're asking for is the truth. My conclusion. Apart from all these rather difficult crosses to bear in our platonic reading lives, there is one preeminent thing that Kierkegaard's vision can help us with, the problem he can solve for us that we probably had not noticed we had. It is rather awkward of us, isn't it, that we all have such different images of Socrates. There's always the possibility that nine-tenths of everyone in human history is simply wrong about him, whereas we, finally, are right. But truly, when you start to consider how pervasive this phenomenon of multiple Socrates is, that everyone would be mostly wrong over all these hundreds of years does start to sound unlikely. 
Perhaps there is some truth to the multiplicity of Socrates that goes beyond our individual loves and avocations. Consider it this way. If there is something truly infinite about the irony of Socrates in his word, deed, and character, then it would be nothing but the truth for all of us to see him differently, for hidden, for his volatility to, to flicker and land somewhere different for each human soul, depending on the hidden philosophical temperaments and nascent commitments in each of us, the very commitments that Plato's Socrates is so brilliantly able to draw out of us. Perhaps each image of Socrates we make is a kind of refraction of the truth of the character that Plato has created, the one who is beautiful young and infinitely strange. If this is so, then part of our philosophical maturity has to be us seeing the distance that the irony of Socrates makes between itself and concrete philosophizing. And so, become capable ourselves of using irony for what it is, not as a stopping point or even as an ideal, but the beginning of something different from itself, something different from a demi-divine knowledge of ignorance. That is, the beginning of human philosophy. In this way, we could start to discover a commonality amongst ourselves that goes above and beyond our fractured love of the infinite series of Socrates. It remains quite true that our images of Socrates, in the way that they differ, cause dissension among those who love Plato. But a possible answer to this problem is sitting right there at the end of my previous sentence. That is, in our obvious commitment to being Philoplatonists, to being the friends of Plato. In this way, we might find the community that insisting on our version of Socrates will never achieve. And just as in order to love Plato, we have to forgive the witch Socrates his warts, we might start to have forbearance for one another. Thank you. <laughs>